This is Leonard Nimoy. You're on the largest oil tanker ever built. Right now, it's fully loaded and traveling the waters of the Southern Ocean through the night on its way to the United States. In the dark night, the captain hears and then sees a helicopter with its landing lights on, flying over the ship, hovering over the landing pad. This is an alert. Helicopter landing. Form an armed party and find out who they are. The small crew of seven men scramble for their rifles and run across the immense deck, running to where the helicopter hovers. Unseen by the captain or any of the crew, a second helicopter hovers, lights off, directly above the bridge, and five armed men are lowered to the roof of the bridge. Distracted by the first helicopter, no one has seen the landing of the second one. Captain, please raise your hands very slowly. On a dark night in the Southern Ocean, the world's largest oil tanker has just been hijacked. And that's only in the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Ship, by Andre Stoika. Our stars, Brock Peters and John Daner. <laughs> Hijack crew takes over the oil tanker. The regular crew is locked in the ship's brig, and the new captain takes charge and adjusts his course. Several hundred miles away is a small, sparsely populated island, and on the island is a lonely man who knows nothing of what has happened. Yet his life is about to be changed by these events. Here's his story. Twenty years is a long time to be in a place, but I've been here that long. When I came to this island, it was with other men from my home. We had heard that the fish ran strong in these waters, and the women believed anything you told them. It was true. But twenty years is twenty years, and now the fish have run out, and the women are wiser. And how do I account for my time? It is true that I have grown. I started as a fisherman, and now I own a store, a provisioner. Well, that's not too bad. In fact, that is how I met Conklin. Maybe a year ago. Hey, Sanduro. <laughs> how many poles have you got stuck in the sand there? I have ten. Ten poles? What do you do with all those fish? With my luck, I'll only catch one. The rest of the poles keep the odds in my favor. Ah, <laughs> I did that once. I put out 50 poles and lines, all baited. And can you guess? They all caught something. It fed a whole village. And I, I, I was just looking for supper. Lucky man. I am a lucky man. And you are lucky, too. Why am I lucky? I have brought you my business. In such a way, I met Conklin, an expansive man. He bought much fishing gear from me, but somehow I don't believe he fished, for I never saw his catch. Some men expand on the truth in their stories, but we don't call them liars. It's just their nature. On the other hand, we don't believe them a lot either. Would you like some coffee? Of course. Hey, did I tell you I was in Sydney? That's a long sail. By myself. You handled the boat alone? By myself. Through a thousand miles of sea. Once the waves rose over a hundred feet and I played them like a game. Dangerous. A game. I played and won. I got there and I got back. What is Sydney like? 
You never been there? No. Yeah. It's marvelous. The, the, the women are very nice, proper, but I know my way around them. One has to be, <laughs> one has to be skillful. You are skillful. Very skillful. Uh, tell me, provisioner, could you outfit a fishing fleet? Of course. I've done it many times. How big a fleet? Maybe six boats. Full crew? Where'd you get your provisions? From a boat. It comes every three weeks. Hmm. That's too bad there's no airfield. Who wants to fly here? Ah, who indeed? <laughs> That's a good question. I am staring at you. And I am seeing a very rich man. I should be so lucky. I'm not talking about luck. I'm talking about fate. We're fated to be together, Sanduro, and this will bring us both a great deal of wealth. I believe in fate. I've often wondered why I was fated to live on this island. With no wife. Mm, there are plenty of women. Ah, but they're smarter now. <laughs> For their own protection. But they're the women in Sydney. Oh, they're more beautiful. You've just been to Sydney? And brought back fate. For you, my friend. And for me. Let's hope fate brings us supper. I had a strike just then and pulled her in. No fight to speak of, but enough size for dinner for two. I invited Conklin to join me, and he agreed. After dinner, we sat on the porch and watched the lights of a small boat at Annika. What is the largest ship you've ever seen? The largest? Not many around here. A big freighter lost her course once. What is the largest ship you have seen? You wouldn't believe me. I might. Well, I'll test you. The largest ship I ever saw was nearly 1,400 feet long. Where did you see it? Two years ago in Japan. They were just building her. For what? Oil. An oil tanker, a huge one. It's the largest ship in the whole world. And you swear this is true? It is true. You will see her. Me see her? What would she do here? She's coming here at this very moment, my friend. She will be here in two days, and then you will see her. But she cannot stop here. There is no depth to the bay. Oh, not in the bay. Out at sea. Two miles out, it is deep. But why? Because, my friend, I have already hijacked her. Hijacked? You? Yes. And now you will join with me. Well, what do you need from me? You're a provisioner. We need provisions. You will provide them. My friend... What you are doing is against the law. What law are you referring to? Have I stolen in anything from anyone on this island? Have I an enemy on this island? Do I harm this island? International laws, probably. Probably. But what is more important, law or oil? I think we'll find out, and you will be with us. I have never violated a law in my life. For me to do this would make me a criminal. My dear friend, you have been here on this island for 20 years, and what have you got? Small life, a very small life. What I'm offering you is a chance for change, a change to a very big life. The owners of that ship want it back. I want to give it back. They will make a nice exchange, and we will all... Be rich. How rich would that be? Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> the businessman in you shows your share will not be less than 50,000 Swiss francs. That much money would surely make a change for me. Well, what must I do for it? You will supply food, clothing, water to the crew of the ship. You will get it through your normal supplier. And you will secretly bring it to the ship when she arrives here. That is all. You are paying a high price for food. I'm paying a high price for your trust. Your loyalty, your discretion. These things are more priceless than food. And if I refuse? You will not refuse. But if I do? I must kill you. 
But I swear that I do not wish to do that. I would rather make you a rich man. It would make me very rich. You might wish to leave this island, return home, or perhaps Sydney. I could introduce you to uh, women there. <laughs> oh, oh, what women. They are much smarter than the women here. Oh, yes, yes, they are. But by then, you would be uh, uh, a very rich man. <laughs> <laughs> Life is full of choices, and Sanduro, a lonely man on a lonely island, has made his choice. He has chosen to side with Conklin and assist in hijacking the world's largest oil tanker. And Conklin has given him money, cash to be used in increasing his inventory of supplies. His timing was perfect, for the next day the supply boat to all these islands came into the bay, and I purchased extra provisions. Mr. Chow, the owner, seemed a little surprised at my order, but he filled it. Very large order, Sandoro. Very large. Like the old days. Perhaps the old days have returned. The fish are running well again? They are running better. I will spread the word. No. What? They are running better than before, and already there are more fishermen. Don't spread the word. Let these men make a living. It has been some time since fishermen could make a living around here. Let them make it. Don't bring more boats here. What do you care? You sell to whoever buys. New fisherman, old fisherman, what do you care? I care. Please. I see. Your order is very expensive. Of course, you have my credit, but... Do you have some money for me in advance, a little down, just in case your judgment has failed you? My judgment has not failed. But yes, I, I have money for you. You do? Oh, very well. I shall not spread the word. Charles was a very suspicious man. He suspected everything. And he was a talkative man. News around the islands travels by radio and by boat, and so when Chow delivers supplies, he delivers news. I tried to keep his suspicions away. After all, what could he suspect? That a great ship full of oil was approaching? So I made my excuses, and he seemed to believe me. He seemed to believe me more when I gave him the money. Sandoro. Here is my bill for your supply. You are charging me double the price. It would seem so. Double the price. You do not wish to pay it? You wish to argue? It is not fair. What is fair? Fair is what I can get. You will pay, would you? Or do you wish to argue? I'll pay. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You... You say there are fish. Others say there are none. You say you wish to have fishermen. There are no fishermen. Look at this bay. Where are the boats? They are They are out at sea. And I didn't see them? No. You have something else in mind. What is it? Why do you need these supplies? Tell me. I will keep your secret. I have no secret. You have no secret. But you will pay double price, won't you? I will pay. Give me the money. Good. You will not talk. I will not talk. Money in hand, he ordered his men to untie his boat. I stood on the dock watching him back up and swing the nose of his boat out toward the ocean. My eyes and mind played tricks on me, for I thought I saw a shadow of something at the mouth of the bay. But it was an illusion. I worried. He knew I was up to something. But could he know about the ship? Would he be truthful to his word, or might a word slip out to someone on one of the other islands? 
would others be curious? My mind worried as his boat slipped away. Perhaps I should have told him the truth. Perhaps I should have made him a partner with me and demanded his silence. Perhaps I am too slow sometimes. And this time I was angry at myself for not having thought of something smart. His boat reached the edge of land and moved out of the bay to the sea. It picked up speed. And I imagined that he was hurrying, hurrying to tell someone that I had a secret. I wanted to wave him back, but he could not see me, for his boat now was very small. The speck of the boat turned bright orange and disappeared in an instant. A few puffs of smoke rose from the water where the boat had been. It happened so fast that I wondered whether it happened at all. But I knew it had. The boat had blown up, and Mr. Chow and his crew were all dead. The money I had paid him was at the bottom of the sea, and it had happened in an instant. I knew Chow, and I knew the explosion couldn't be an accident. And if the explosion wasn't an accident, it must have been on purpose. I was very much afraid. The next day, Conklin arrived, and I told him of the explosion and my fear. He expressed great sympathy for the crew, but he knew nothing else about it. Together, we loaded the supplies onto my boat, and midday, we set out to sea to meet the great ship. Keep the steady course, my friend. Hold at 240 degrees. We'll lower in the water from the cargo. Well, we'll lighten her soon. Fog ahead. Don't worry. I've got a true bearing. And, of course, I've got this. What is it? Kind of radar. I can sight that ship in the fog even if my bearing is wrong. In the fog? You must show me. I will. Straighten her up, my friend. It is lucky that this is a calm sea. I told you, you're a lucky man. The fog surrounded us close and thick. At times I could not even see Conklin, who stood with his radar only seven feet away. I grew tired. It is not difficult to run my boat under most conditions. But fully loaded, it lay close to the water. And each change in course I made with difficulty. I could not see where we were heading, but Conklin didn't mind. He worked with his box, and after a few minutes, a sound came from it. What is it, Conklin? The radar is working. It's working perfectly. Change course to 242 degrees. My boat would not turn. We had been through a great deal, and I have shown her respect, and now she showed me respect. She worked harder than she was used to. But she did it. We moved through the fog, and my eyes watched the compass constantly. But there was not more to be seen. And then Conklin shouted to me, Stop! Here! We have reached the ship. I can't see it. We have not reached the ship. We've reached a point on the chart. A very small point, but an important one. You see, my friend, the ship will reach us. Fogs at sea can lie thick and dense, swirling walls of white, blinding the traveler. In such a fog, two men wait for a monster ship. Conklin hunched over his radar box and his face froze in concentration. Several times I wanted to talk with him, but his concentration was so deep that I was afraid to disturb him. The fog was so thick I could not watch the waves, and it seemed wrong to want to fish, so I sat with my thoughts and waited silently. I thought of Sydney and how I would be there soon, rich and respected. I thought of the beautiful women of Sydney and how they would swoon over me. And I thought, I will be nice to them. Not like some rich men I have heard of. I will be very nice, and they will be very nice. And then Conklin spoke for the first time in two hours. It is here. What? 
The ship is here. I don't see anything. Look on the screen. Yes. See how this sweeps? I see it. Now, watch. Now, over here. See the blip of green? That is the ship? That's it. About five miles from us. It'll be here in less than an hour. <laughs> I could see nothing, and the silence of the fog began to wear on me. You hear? Yes, Conklin. It's coming. Conklin, are we safe? Safe? Of course. But a ship as big as you say, if it were to hit us, it would break our boat apart and suck us beneath the bow. It could, but it won't. We're very safe here. Because while I'm watching them on this radar, they're watching us on their radar. We're very safe. That is, we're safe if they're hungry for this food. My eyes searched the fog for a sign. In my mind, I thought the ship would run over us, but Conklin seemed so certain that it wouldn't. I was not sure. One moment, I was certain it would run over us, and I began to tremble. And then the fog began to thin, and the thinning slowly became a lifting. And with the lifting, I could see the ship. In my wildest imagination, I could not have imagined a thing like that ship. I could see the bow, but the stern was so far away. Conklin was right. It towered above us so that unless I looked straight up, my vision was all black with the hull. And Conklin was also right in that we were in no danger, for it was not angled toward us. It had come to a complete stop in the water. It was a monster. I raised the sea anchors and started the engine and headed for the monster ship. Its shadow fell nearly a quarter of a mile port side, and we moved into it so that while it was still day, we were moving into darkness. Conklin directed me, and he motioned upward to the deck. They gave him a signal, and he told me to stop the engines. From above on the deck, a crane swung out over us, carrying a large wooden platform. When we could reach it, Conklin and I guided it to our deck, and the two of us loaded it with the supplies. Three times we loaded the platform, and three times it was carried up to the deck, unloaded, and lowered again to us. The fourth time completed the delivery of the supplies. Conklin packed his radar box and put his things on top of the boxes of supplies. Full and complete delivery, my friend. You've done a fine job of it. If I start back to the shore now, I'll have light most of the way. Start back? Aren't you curious to see the ship? I'm curious, but I think it is safer for me to leave now. Remember, I must find another source of supply. My friend, you have delivered his promise. Now please step onto the platform. We'll both take a ride up to the deck. Then I must fix the anchor or she will float away. Oh, don't concern yourself with that. You'll have no more need for your boat. No more need. Onto the platform. From somewhere he had pulled out a gun and he pointed it at me. I had no time to think and so I did as he told me and stepped onto the platform. He stepped on the other side and still holding his gun at me, made a signal. The crane pulled us up. And I looked down at my boat as it got smaller and smaller as we rose higher and higher until finally the crane swung us away from the water and lowered us onto the deck of the ship. As I stepped off the platform onto the deck, Conklin motioned to another man, and he also had a gun in his hand. Here's our provisioner. Take him below with the crew. Right. You will walk ahead of me. Conklin... What is happening? My friend Sandoro, your life on the island has kept you far from, uh, what, the greed of man? Oh, you are an innocent. I admire that quality. You have served your purpose, and I'm afraid we're finished with you. Finished with me? Mm. You, you promised me 50,000 Swiss francs. I lied. 
You lied to me? Ah, uh, what can I say? You know I'm a born liar, and <laughs> lying, lying to you wasn't difficult. Now, I'm afraid there are no 50,000 Swiss francs for you, and I'm sorry to say your life itself is in some question, but you may be certain I'll do what I can for you. My boat. Your boat will be destroyed. It is the final link between the food supply and the ship, and when your boat is destroyed, there will be no way of finding us out here at sea. Conklin, you are a very bad man. Me? Bad? Ah, I suppose you're right. I was led from the deck of the ship to the control building, and the man behind me pushed on an elevator button, and we waited. We stood on a deck just below the bridge of the ship, and I could see out, down to the water, and my boat which had floated away from the great tanker. Then, just as the elevator door opened, my boat turned a bright orange, just as Mr. Chow's boat had done. My boat was gone without a trace. My boat, which had served me so well. I wanted to cry with anger, but the armed man pushed me into the elevator, and the door closed, shutting me off from the world. I could not guess what was ahead of me, but in my mind I kept thinking, my life is over, my life is over. And I truly thought it was. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of The Ship. Trick you. Sure, you're right. How does it feel to be behind these bars? I was too greedy, Captain. I think I should have suspected something. Well, greed gets to all of us at one time or another. Think of the greed of those guys on the bridge who took over my ship. I wonder what they're planning to do with us. I think... I think they will kill us. I think so, too. This, uh, this island you come from, how far would you make it? Two miles. Maybe a little bit more. You hear that? Two miles on a calm sea? It's a possible swim. Yeah, I can do it. But we would have to to be out of here to be able to swim. Oh, we can get out all right. We just didn't know there was an island out there to get to. And now you know. Now I think it's time for us to leave this ship. Yeah. Me too? Why? After all, you were on their side. I paid for it. My boat is lost. It, it was a big loss for me. <laughs> I'm sure it was. I have a home on the island. There is food, water, and a radio. Uh, Captain, <coughs> we could radio our position. We could. Or he could be setting us up for something. Tell me, Sandero, are you setting a trap for us? Still working for them? Oh, if he is, he'll be with us. It's the same trap. Captain took some tools from somewhere. And with the help of the crew, broke the lock on the prison door. Beyond this was a large metal door, and the captain broke through this, its lock, too. It was so easy, I could see that they could have escaped at any time they wanted to. They simply had no place to escape to. We slipped through the empty corridors of the great ship unnoticed until we found a stairway. We moved up the stair past landings and doors. The captain knew his ship, and finally on one landing at one door, he stopped us. Okay, we're on the starboard side. Fifty feet from this door is a ladder to water level. That's a long climb down. Take it slow, you'll be okay. Now remember... The real workout is the swim after we get down. You got it? It's going to be dark out there. So we'll hold on to one another until we get there. What if they uh, spot us? If they spot us, just hurry. I figure they're mostly on the bridge. It'll take them ten minutes at least to get to the side. By that time, we'll be partway down. Once we're in the water, 
We'd be hard to find. Yeah. While we're on that ladder, we'll be like sitting ducks. The captain opened the door and we stepped onto the deck. It was good to be in the fresh air of the sea and I breathed deeply as we crept along the side of the ship. Then a strange thing happened. The black sky was suddenly bright with flares. Are they crazy? Using flares near an oil chamber? The flares lit up the sky and the ship, and I thought for sure we would be seen. Prepare to be boarded. We have you covered. Come within 50 yards of us. We'll blow you out of the water. What's happening, Captain? Sounds like someone's trying to hijack the hijackers. What do we do? Keep moving. If they start shooting, this whole ship can blow up. I don't want to think about that. The ladder, one by one, we slipped over the side of the great tanker. The attention of the bridge was on the other ship to port, and they never saw us. It was such a long way down, rung by rung. We climbed down very slowly and more and more painfully. And the farther down we were, the less and less we could hear of what was going on between the ships. We climbed down, and as I moved, I thought of the oil that was just beyond the metal plating of the ship, inches from my face, and that it was getting ready to explode. <laughs> Two miles. Only two miles. Let's put on some distance. We all swam, each at his own pace. I am not a fast swimmer, and in the darkness, I felt that everyone had swum ahead of me. But even though I am not fast, I am constant. And in a while, I turned back to see how far I had swum. The dark shape of the ship could be seen under the light of the flares. I had swum a good distance. I looked for the captain. I looked for the crew but could not see them, and I thought it would not be smart to call out to them. So I turned back toward the island and began swimming again. My arms were heavy, but I thought, it is my will. I will be better. And I swam on until something made me stop again. And I turned back to see the ship. What the captain had said might happen had really happened. What I saw was a great ball of fire rise from the middle of the ship into the air. And then a second ball of fire rose from the bow of the ship. And another explosion until instead of a ship, I was looking only at fire. And within the fire I thought I could see the ship rise into the air. I knew I must continue to swim, for such explosion would cause a wave of water, and if I'm caught, I will drown. I swam as hard as I could, and my mind was a blank with only one thought in it, to reach my island before the wave. But I was not strong enough. In the darkness, I could feel the wave coming from me. Rushing from me. And then I felt caught up in it, twisted by it, enveloped in it. I was spinning in the dark water, and after I passed in the air, the black light and the black water closed out to me. Dazzled my head. My lungs filled, and I tried to cry out. My mind went blank, and I slipped into another world. Of what happened after my body reached the shore of my island, I know only from stories of the villagers. I heard that there was a wall of fire around the island from the oil, and it was a mile high and lasted a week. But I do not believe it. I heard that the men of the island pulled their boats ashore to keep them from burning because the whole ocean was on fire. But my boat was already destroyed, and so I can only tell what has been told to me. I heard that the tides and wind shifted so that the ocean of oil floated away from our island. But I saw none of these things, for I lay unconscious for nearly two weeks, tended by the islanders. And there was talk among them that 
I was failing, and that soon I would die. One morning, after two weeks of unconsciousness, my eyes opened and I slowly began to see my home on the island. Casey, one of the fishermen, came in to look after me, and he told me of what happened. You should have seen it. He tried to tell me of everything that had happened, but my mind was on the captain, and I stopped his talk to learn about the crew. They are gone. Dead? No, a helicopter came for them. I've never seen such a huge helicopter. And they were all alive. Well, almost one died in the wave. Let me tell you about the wave. Only one dead. A miracle. It's all a miracle. Will you let me tell you about it? And he told me about it. But I was too weak to listen. And when I was well, he told me again. By the time I was out of bed, the island was normal again. A month later, some money came for me from the company that owned the tanker. It was a reward for saving the captain and most of his crew. It wasn't a large sum, but it was enough to buy another boat. Since Mr. Chow died, I took over his route. Now I am supplier to all the islands here. It is not a big life for me, but it is better than before. I have stopped dreaming of Sydney and the beautiful women. They were only dreams. I have my own life, and it is here. Sometimes, I think back to Conklin. Poor Conklin. And what he told me. Perhaps I am a lucky man. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Ship, was written by Andre Stoika and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Brock Peters and John Daner. Featured in the cast were Tyler McVeigh, Marvin Miller, and Andre Stoika. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. <laughs> <laughs>